where receiving a hug is as important as receiving a medal. A sports event where everyone wins. The 1992 Iowa Special Olympics, tonight at 6 p.m., only on Iowa Public Television. This week on Living in Iowa, we'll look for the whole truth. I'm Morgan Halgren, and on this week's show, we'll see if pesticide ingredient labels tell the whole truth, investigate what ozone holes mean to our skin and eyes, and meet a superhero who's holed up in garbage. Watch Living in Iowa, always something a little different, tonight at 7.30. Next time on Frontline, boxing promoter Don King. Don's hair, his jewelry, his lingo, it's all an act. It's to confuse, it's to obscure. But essentially, he's a con man. It's the con man as buffoon. So I don't have no use for you, Jack Newfield. Yes, Reporter Jack Newfield investigates the dark side of Don King, his criminal past, and his handling of young fighters. In Don King, Unauthorized. See you Tuesday at 8. Good morning, I'm Dean Borg. Welcome to another Sunday edition of Iowa Press. On Wednesday this past week, as expected, Governor Terry Branstad vetoed the key portions of the appropriations bills passed up to him by the Iowa legislature. Actually, it's the second rejection by the governor in the legislature's work, once at the close of the regular session, and once after the callback session of two weeks ago, and now there's a second callback session on the horizon. And Governor Branstad joins us today to discuss what has to happen, in his opinion, for the state's executive and legislative branches to come together to find a resolution to the current budget crisis. And just what might happen to Iowa's shaky financial and economic outlook should an agreement not be reached will also be on the discussion table, keeping in mind that the state's current budget is a thing of the past as of July 1st. Coming up, though, in just a moment now, is this week's edition of the McLaughlin Group from the nation's capital. John McLaughlin and his team of capital reporters will review the close of the primary season and the candidacies of George Bush, Bill Clinton, and H. Ross Perot. The panel will also review the proceedings at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. That's the McLaughlin Group coming up now from Washington, D.C. Then, at the top of the hour, it's I Press with Governor Terry Branstad, so stay tuned. Securities Corporation of Iowa, with offices in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, is committed to the thorough discussion of today's current events and proud to help bring you the Iowa broadcast of the McLaughlin Group. The nation's capital, the McLaughlin Group, an unrehearsed program presenting inside opinions and forecasts on major issues of the day. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. Here's the moderator, John McLaughlin. Issue one, let the games begin. When that convention of ours is over, I'm coming out of there with my sleeves rolled up, ready to take this fight to every precinct in this country. You and I both know that all day, every day, from the Republican Party, it's just saturation bombing with dirty tricks. I've got one opponent who says he'll do whatever it takes to hold on to the White House. Then there's another person running who says he'll spend whatever it takes to get the White House. Bill Clinton clinched the Democratic presidential nomination this week, and George Bush swept all his primaries. But the big story again is H. Ross Perot. In California exit polls, an astounding one out of three Democrats said they would have voted for Perot if he were on the California primary ballot. And nearly one out of two Republicans said the same. On Thursday night, President Bush held a press conference, which was carried only by Cable News Network. Mr. Bush was peppered with questions about Perot, most of which he dodged, but a few got through. As in this exchange, Mr. Bush, I ask you, if Ross Perot were to say to you, give me one reason to follow you, 
What would you say to Perot? Oh, I'd say good. Let me, let me refresh you on our domestic agenda. Please give me your support for the balanced budget amendment that we're trying to pass right now and bring along Bill Clinton if you got any influence on it. We're talking about issues here. We got a tough crime bill before the Congress. Help me pass it. We've got an education reform bill that literally revolutionizes education. Give me a hand with this one. If you know anybody in the Congress, appears you may, give them a call. The president resisted all opportunities to attack Perot, holding the focus sharply on his own agenda, calling on Congress to pass his crime bill, his education reforms, his growth incentives for the economy, his environmental proposals, and especially his balanced budget amendment. Now before Congress, first called for by him in February of 89, which Mr. Bush mentioned more than 20 times. Question, did George Bush do himself a favor with his primetime press conference? I ask you, Fred Bond. George Bush never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity, and he had one with this press conference, but what he has to do is attack Ross Perot. Ross Perot is eating his base away of Republicans and Reagan Democrats and independents, and George Bush sits back and thinks, uh, and his aides tell him, you know, be undignified to attack, the press will do it. He's living in Dukakis land. The press can't carry this issue. It needs the president, the candidate, to give it some visibility, to have it dominate the campaign, to give it legs, talking oh. about... Uh, Ross Perot's flip-flopping, talking about Ross Perot's wheeling and dealing. Republicans in particular are looking for some leadership, some fight from this guy, and they're getting none of it. Remember, one more thing, John. Remember when Bush began attacking Mike Dukakis in 1988? June 1988, exactly four years ago, attacking him on these issues uh, like the flag and, the, and, uh, and, and, and Willie Horton and so on. Everybody said it would be undignified for him to do it, but Lee Atwater said only way we raise these issues, their visibility, is if the candidate himself does it, Bush has to do it again. You are living proof that this country should support a treaty on biological diversity. <laughs> Richard Nixon today said the exact opposite of what he has said, that the one thing that Bush should not do is attack Ross Perot. What do you think, Christopher Matthews? Well, I think that uh, clearly Bush knows that Perot is killing him out there. I was out in California for the last two weeks. All the people that I've known out there for years, always Republican, are all for Perot. Not just for Perot, sort of, enthusiastically for Perot. So he's losing his base. The Silicon Valley, the high-tech type of people, the guys who know how, what it means to create a job, who want jobs for their kids and want opportunities for their kids, who want to see the country moving somewhere, they all love Perot. They think he's a can-do Republican. He, to them, is the real Republican candidate. And that's what should scare Bush's socks off. Jack, come on. They, they, uh, well, first of all, in the press conference, I think he was very lucky that NBC, CBS, and ABC chose not to air it because it was a disaster. I mean, he comes out there and he's talking about the balanced budget of I mean, Come on, let's, he's been talking about that for 15 years. They, um, I think on the business of pro, I, I, intend to, I intend to find myself in agreement, believe it or not, with Richard M. Nixon on this thing because... <laughs> I, I, Namely, I, don't attack. I, don't attack right now for this reason. That, that I think he has to, first of all, he has to put a positive spin on his own performance and he has to have something something new to do which he hasn't uh, new to cite which he doesn't have this is bush this is bush but attacking Perot, the danger in attacking pro right now is that the people who are with ross pro don't like negative politics and you don't want to alienate them because they're your people you're going to want to have them eventually and you want to make it easy for them to come to you eventually they don't like negative politics what do they think ross Perot represents i mean ross Perot is a walking negative he's a tantrum you know that's what the Ross Perot candidacy is all about. Well, that is not the way they see it. Well, that's right. all right, but Ross Perot does nothing but attack the status quo and attack George Bush. Now, He's a winner. George, just like second. You've got to ask yourself, what would Harry Truman or FDR or John F. Kennedy or Ronald Reagan do in a similar situation? Duck the question, have the story on the front page of the, of the papers be uh, President Duck's contra, uh, confrontation with opponent? No. They, he would have had something funny to say, something dismissive to say, something, something uh, correct to say about, about the, uh, the menace that Ross Perot presents, potentially to the Constitution, that kind of stuff. Do you agree with Jack Jamon that Bush has no issue with the balanced budget amendment? I, absolutely. I think the budget, balanced budget amendment is a total fraud. And it, it's a desecration no of the issue. Constitution. Okay. It's a desecration. It's a desecration of the Constitution. It is, no, it is a desecration it is a desecration of the Constitution, oh. much as much as the Perot candidacy is a sort of a cavalier uh, do attitude. Do you to the think Constitution. that Jack Jamond is right in trashing the performance of George Bush last night uh, yes. at the press conference? You I do. do? You I didn't do. get anything on it. You didn't. I, I think. John, I thought. Just agree with you. I thought there was a level of animation. Particularly, he was particularly effective also on his treatment of the Rio summit. He didn't have. 
have anything new to say. And what do you But he did the best. I, here's why he I did think. the best that he could with what he had. Jack and he showed himself. energy and, and he uh, and he no, showed no, that also was, an John, ability the whole, to handle the press. The whole point is that wasn't the best he had. And here's where I disagree. I, uh, Jack prefers Richard Nixon to me. But uh, I, I can <laughs> oh, no, but here, here's where Jack's wrong about <laughs> negative politics. Everybody says they're against negative politics. But the fact is, negative politics work. And the stories that are in the print press that talk about all the devious doings of Ross Pro haven't gotten on television. The only way to get them on television is if the president himself elevates them and puts them You're the only one on this this panel that feels that Bush ought to attack Perot now. Am I right on that? I think he ought to to, to, to have something. He certainly ought to comment on the issue, raise the questions, and, you know, fundamentally attack, get get those negative issues up there. Jack, quick. If he could... If he could turn it away, as you suggested earlier, with humor and so forth, that would be one thing. He's not capable of that. <laughs> okay. And, and, and the, the, but the, let, me, let me make the point, let me make this point about the, about the pro people. They are, everybody does say they're against negative politics. But the pro people, a lot of them are occasional voters who've been outside the system, who are being brought into this thing by pro. They are, the, they are certainly more likely to react against negativism than your average voter. They are salon revolutionaries, according to no, Richard no, Cohen. Not no. bad. No, okay, let's suburbanized. focus for a minute on Bill Clinton. By all accounts, the Arkansas governor should have had a banner week. On Tuesday, Clinton won all six primary states. And on Wednesday, moreover, he appeared on the Asenio Hall Show playing the saxophone. Okay, Chris, what is your position on late-night facts? Well, I have to say that if he's going to replace Doc Severinsen, he's way ahead of everybody. But I don't think he's going for Doc what Severinsen's job. What shape is the campaign in? It, look, let me just answer it my way. There's three Bill Clintons that I've been able to discern. There's the public Bill Clinton that didn't sell very well. That's sort of the slick, slick willy guy that answers all the questions. Great tactician, no strategy. And then there's the middle grade guy we saw there. Everybody says you get along with Bill Clinton. He's a regular guy. He's a swinger. But I didn't think he had to prove he was a swinger tonight. That's what he's out there trying to prove. Then there's another Bill Clinton. There's the real raw kid who grew up to be an adult, who went through a, a parents with an alcoholic father, stepfather, really tough upbringing. I interviewed him last week out there in Los San Francisco. Oh. The guy comes across as a human being, a guy who's had tough, tough times in his life, who you can root for. No one's ever rooted for Bill Clinton in this campaign. That's what he has missing. And I think people will start saying, what a regular guy, I like him. And that hasn't come across. This you going to vote for him, Chris? You going to vote for him? Probably, John, but I'll tell you, this is not going to make me vote for him. Because John? this makes him look like Lee Atwater. How can, Lee he, Atwater win? How can like, he win? How can he win? What's the scenario? He has to keep it. The, the question the Wall Street Journal Paul always asks is, does he look out for people like you? I think Clinton has to win that argument. He looks no, out for people like you. This is you. how he wins. Perot flames out and the change vote goes to Clinton and Clinton wins. No, That's how it happens. John, there's something before that. By the way, did you recognize what song he was playing? Yes, Heartbreak Hotel. <laughs> Somebody told you. You no, didn't know no, that. No, no, no. Come on. Hey, a renaissance I was man. Sure you it's <laughs> tough being a renaissance man in a post-renaissance yeah, yeah, era. Yeah. Look, here's why Clinton is in good shape. He, uh, there's something prior to Perot flaming out. What he's getting now, or what Clinton is getting, is Perot is eating up George Bush, bringing Bush down. So that helps Clinton, and then when Pearl flames out, then Clinton could win. benefit. Yeah. I'll, I'll, tell you how, I'll tell you how Clinton can win yeah. this election and what the, what the dangers are. Perot is not going to vanish off the screen. He's going to be a factor, more of a factor than any other third-party candidate, even if he is not a, an even, even a, a ground competitor at the end. That being the case, what's important is basis. Clinton has a base of black voters. He has a base of, of Jewish voters, of, of the devout liberals who don't like the authoritarian trend in um, and what they see in Perot. The problem, Clinton can win some states he would not otherwise win because of Perot being there, and he can win the election this way. And Clinton has to hold that base. The danger for Clinton is that he, is that he makes an appeal to that base, particularly to blacks, that would bounce back against him, would redound against him with other constituencies. But, but, but he has a chance to win this thing hey, with 42% of a bunch of Clinton states. Clinton holds the South still. No, he and doesn't. if the white vote is split between Perot and Bush, but the blacks go with Clinton, and a sliver of the white vote, then Clinton well, wins a, the South, right? Not a sliver. But he needs, he needs 20 to 25%. 20 and that gives him the South. But Clinton yeah. cannot, cannot move too soon to this 34% strategy, so-called, where he only relies on the blacks, because he will offend all, all the whites then by, 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 being, by being too close to Jesse Jackson, for example. So if he's going to do it, he's going to have to do it late. He's already been on very thin ice by appealing in this emotional pitch for gay voters. Uh, that's bound to hurt him among voters, particularly in the South. Yeah. He's going to get his big boost, of course, in the July convention. All right, exit question. Who won the week? Bush 
Perot or Clinton? That's easy. I mean, it was Perot all the way. Perot all the way? Perot's still, Perot's still gaining. Perot still, still gaining? going up, yep. Jack, Perot? Yeah, again, sure. Despite the fact that Clinton, you know, won all the things? But listen, this is... Perot? Perot. Perot, Perot, Perot on the week. Issue two, Perot Puri. Item, insider trading. Political pros Ed Rollins and Hamilton Jordan jumped on the Perot bandwagon this week as co-chairman of his campaign. Rollins, a Republican, was Ronald Reagan's campaign manager in 84. Jordan, a Democrat, was Jimmy Carter's campaign manager in 76 and 80 and his White House chief of staff. Their price, price tag, $300,000 each which works out to $2,000 a day, and who knows what goodies are in store for them after the campaign is over, win or lose. Item, thus spake Milhouse. Former President Richard Nixon weighed in this week with his lucid views on the Perot candidacy. Well, he has a chance to win, which I would not have said even two weeks ago. Perot will have the strongest support of any third-party candidate in this century, except possibly for Theodore Roosevelt in, in 1912. He is a non-politician. He is for change, and the American people want change. I think he's going to be a formidable candidate. At the present time, I say it's a two-man race, a race between Bush and Perot. It's going to be close, but in the end, I think President Bush will win. Item, name your price. Billionaire Ross Perot admitted that he is buying the presidency, but insisted it, that he's buying it for the right reasons. Realistically, it's very simple. I told the American people, if they put me on the ballot, that I would finance my own campaign, that I would not belong to anybody but them, and I would go to Washington as their servant. So in just plain Texas talk, I am buying it for them because they can't afford it. Hitherto, it had been thought that $100 million was the ceiling on how much Perot would spend on his campaign. Now, however, Mr. Perot says spending $350 million, well over one quarter of a billion dollars, is entirely possible. How did Perot fare this week? More in detail, Jack Jamont. Well, I, I think a couple of things. I mean, one of the things that Perot is, um, Perot benefits from this business of taking Hamilton, Jordan, and Ed Ronalds, one from each party, people who know how to do things, mechanics. That was a smart move. I, I, think, it was, I think it was a smart move. In fact, they're both smart guys and how to do things. And he had to recognize that you have to be able to put together all this volunteer force and convert it into something that is practical. I think, uh, I think he did very well. I thought the most interesting moment was when he was being pursued by Dan Rather on on the tax question and rather asked him, are you saying essentially that um, uh, read my lips, no new taxes, and Pro, who is a genius of the instant soundbite, said, I'm never saying that dumb. Stupid, something, right. you know, stupid. And th that is the kind of thing he does very well. The one thing he has, he's having a problem with for the first time is the hardening of, of, of attitudes on him and this authoritarianism that he shows sometimes, as for example, when he talked about homosexuals and adulterers in his cabinet, is beginning to build a backlash. No, okay. Look, that, those were, are, are called moral values. That's not authoritarianism. I think he's an authoritarian. That's not an example. Now, just a second. It, just a second. How is he going to find out whether somebody's a homosexual or a uh, or an adulterer? Is he going to is going to sick one of his uh, one of his teams of private investigators uh, on him to find out? I, I mean, that's the implication. I okay. Let's, the implication. Talk about, let's talk about Perot. Let's talk about Perot. His Perot credibility. Okay. Right. Exhibit A. Last weekend, Perot told Jesse Jackson he would not criticize his opponents. I do not engage in their tactics. I will not criticize any other candidate. Okay, now watch this. When discussing the Persian Gulf War, Perot said this. I will not go to war to prove my manhood at the expense of young people. Perot attacked Dan Quayle's manhood this week after Perot was shown a clip of Marilyn Quayle criticizing Perot for buying the U.S. presidency. I find it fascinating that grown men are hiding behind their women. Uh, that's a personal ob observation. Uh, you know, if they have anything to say, why don't they step out front and say it themselves? If they want to get in the ring, come on in the ring, we'll have it, you get it on. But no, no, they, they're afraid to do that. They send the women out to do it for them. Another credibility gap for Perot. Issues. Where does he stand on them? In an interview with Barbara Walters, Perot was asked whether he would hire known homosexuals for certain cabinet-level positions. No, I don't want anybody there that will be a, a point of controversy with the American people that will distract from the work to be done. This week, Katie Couric returned to the issue with Perot. Last week, you did alienate a number of voters by saying you would ban homosexuals from certain jobs in your cabinet and that you favor a ban against homosexuals in the military. Do you stand by those positions this well, morning? Well, no, you completely misstated my positions. 
I mean, that was completely misstated. I was asked a very, very narrow, specific question about appointing a known homosexual to a cabinet position. And I had frankly never thought about it. I told Barbara Walters, I said, probably not because it would be so controversial. My mind had, when she asked me the question, immediately went to the Judge Thomas Anita Hill hearings. And I saw two wonderful people destroyed for partisan reasons. And I would not want to subject anybody to that. So your position stands that you would not put no, a known no, homosexual... No, no, you, you've misstated my position well, every I'm time sorry, you said it. I, I don't understand your position, I guess, is the bottom line, well, Mr. Perot. Here's the good news the American people do. Kindly assess Perot's believability in light of his contradictions and evasions, at least perceived contradictions and evasions. I ask you more time. Well, on occasion, I have heard him say that you could bal that in order to balance the budget, for example, four hundred billion dollars, that you'd have to you could eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse and get and get rid of it. Other times, I've heard him say you have to raise taxes and cut spending. And lately, he's been saying that you don't have to raise taxes at all. Now, at some point, he's going to have to say which it is. And at this point, he either doesn't know or he's not willing to say. And I don't think, I don't think the bottom line here is that the American people are going to roll the dice and, and uh, elect somebody, President of the United States, who has never held an office, whom they don't know. Teddy Roosevelt, the last third-party candidate who was really strong, was, had least served as president for a time, and people know who he was. This guy, this guy is a guy who says, well, we can, you know, do this with the Constitution or do that with the Constitution. Um, and, uh, you know, and you don't know what's safe Why do you think he's evading? On the basis of what Doonesbury says, that if he takes a stand, he loses his supporters? I think he, clear, he has not thought it out yet. You know, he also says, uh, I'm not going to conduct any polls. Well, what is this electronic town meeting? We're going to discuss the alternatives with the people. Make, we're going to see what they Jack, say, and Jack, then we're going to make up our me, minds. That's a poll. Let me make a point. We, we're, we're, all, we're missing the point here. The point is that Ross Perot juxtaposed himself against reporters, the press, against a bunch of white middle-aged guys sitting around gabbing, shooting off our mouths. He juxtaposed himself against them. They're going to take him every time. They have got no use for the media at all. The voters I'm talking is about. Is it as simple no, wait, as that, do you think? It's simple as that. You know that guy is being pulled out of it? Yes, it's that simple, because no, remember the guy being pulled out of the cement truck, being beaten up? Who are you rooting for? The guy's beating him up or the guy in the cement truck? Now, I'll tell you, what well, the big story this week was Jordan and Rollins, because if there's two big problems, each political party has tremendous problems. Let's face it, we're rejecting the two political parties with Perot. The American people say, we don't like the Democrats because they're interest group dominated. Hamlin and Jordan hated that about the Democratic Party, where the fundraising tables define the party. Israel, labor, whatever else, gays, the whole party was represented by who paid for the tables. That's why the American people hate the Democratic Party. The Republican Party is an elite country club party. Ed Rollins was a Reagan Democrat, a Reagan Republican, who brought in the working class Knights of Columbus kind of guy. If they can bring the Knights of Columbus northern ethnic Catholic and then get the southern white guy, they're going to win this election. Yeah. Perot has brilliantly staked out the two biggest weaknesses in the political party. What's that Catholic? got to do with Jordan and uh, Rollins? Because Rollins is against the Republican Party because it's going back to its country club roots, its Whig party roots, and giving up on guys like him who came from the streets. He's a working class labor oriented Democrat from California, and he's the very kind of guy that Bush doesn't like. So therefore, right. he's, he's picked right. two rejectionists of their own Body, but no, but they, which supports his independent uh, right. thinking and his indep independent John, Look at the polls this week. Ohio Democrats went for Perot. That personifies exactly what, what's going on in the Democratic Party. The working class Archie hey, Bunker guy hey, was... Hey, look, are you John. telling me that this country is ready not only for a third party, but for a multi-party? No, we're ready to get parties. rid of two anachronistic parties that have lost their <laughs> oh, coalition. Hey, John, oh, so John, what's going to happen? John, what's the At the presidential secret? level, we're going to be picking the person, not the party well, anymore. We, we've done that for a long time to some extent. Look. Uh, the credibility problem is a, a much bigger problem than I think Jack and Chris are Jack letting on for this, for, this for this reason. You can bomb the press as a candidate for weeks, but eventually the American people get tired of it. And here's the problem for Perot. There are so many flip-flops. My favorite is the one where he says, I don't have political handlers. Then he hires Jordan and, uh, and Rollins and says, oh, by handlers, I, and he describes a handler as a valet. Everybody knows what a handler is, a Your political interest. consultant you hire. The problem is, the American people, after months of this flip-flopping, are going to get the idea that Ross Perot doesn't well, talk they straight. they haven't and got that, it yet. They let's, haven't got it yet. But Jack, this hey. is June. The election's in November. Right, right. He, he's on his honeymoon now, but that honeymoon air and that balloon is going, to, it's going to disappear. But let's get out on this one question. Was it a really smart move for Ross Perot to select Hamilton Jordan and Ed Rollins as his professional managers? Bearing in mind that he pretends to be an outsider and he's got two consummate insiders with him now. What do you think? He had to hire somebody and you need some insiders running a so, national campaign. And, so he, 
It's so a plus. That positive. Positive. They're both mavericks like him, and as I said, they personify what's wrong with each of the two parties. Smart yeah. No, smart and for the reasons that Chris says. Smart or dumb? Smart, smart because he needs the help, and because if you'll notice, interestingly, he did not appear with them. Uh, they, were, they were hired by his guys as functionaries, right? He did, there's no picture of him with handlers. Well stated. Well stated, and by the way, sympathies on the fact that they took the new Elvis stamp. I know you wanted the old <laughs> Elvis stamp because you look like the old Elvis. You do, John. <laughs> the answer is they, he was very smart to pick Jordan and Rollins. Issue 3, Blame It on Rio. The world's first Earth Summit began this week in Rio de Janeiro. The 12-day conference, sponsored by the United Nations, is turning into a battle over who will pay to clean up the global environment. Developing nations like India, Malaysia, and Brazil say that industrialized nations like the U.S., Great Britain, and France are to blame for destroying the environment. The developing nations want the industrialized nations to cover most of the cost of repairing the environment. A cool $125 billion per year. President Bush is going to Rio next week. Mr. President, what would you bring to the Earth Summit? I am not going to go down there and forget about people that need jobs in the United States of America. I'm going to take a strong record, the leading record on science and technology, the leading record on oceans, the leading record on forests, the leading records on uh, protecting the elephant, the leading records on CFCs. Question, what will be the headlines coming out of Rio next week, Chris Matthews? Well, I think it's going to be the United States is the, fairly or not, the United States is the odd man out in terms of the biodiversity treaty because the host country is, is Brazil and they're for it and we're against it. I think if Bush is smart, he'll finesse it and say somewhere down the road we'll try to sign a treaty. But I think we will be the bad guy in the short run. No, wait Thank you, Chris. Oh, you have just single-handedly widened the hole in the ozone layer. Just hey, this is you a know, great... No, no, just a second. Let me... Just, Fred, John, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, again, is another great opportunity for Bush to go down there. He was good on that press conference on that issue. He was excellent. But... He I like the go, part about the elephants. Well, he can I don't think that's going to be the headline coming out of it. Bush preserves elephant. That isn't going to be it. Republicans but he can go down it. there. He, he can go down there and stand up to the third world extortionists and tell them they're not going to get zillions of dollars from the U.S. and Europe uh, uh, for whatever they want. He can declare global warming the hoax that it is, and he can uh, uh, bat around the environmental extremists who dominate the thing and show some leadership and vigor and for And he can range. also but showcase his own is, environmental record. The problem, you, you know, the problem is, is that the American press is so committed to this environmentalist agenda. I mean, it, 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 it has taken the place of socialism as the, as and the, religion. As, as the way of saving, of saving the planet, both for the third world and for the American press. And he's going to get battered for it, and you're exactly right. What he ought to do is say, all of the evidence indicates that global warming is not happening, uh, and, and also that we are ahead on uh, catalytic converters and, and all kinds of other pollution yeah. devices. The United States led the way. The, uh, the, the environmental extremists at that meeting are about the only people who could make him look like he has a good record on the environment. And it's, it's you can't true. say all the evidence says there's no true. global warming. All the evidence doesn't say that at all. It's contradictory evidence. No, and no, his record no, no, on the no. environment is not no, good enough just a second. in look, any other context look, to look the, good. The, the global warming case is based on a computer model. Every time anybody has tried to check the computer model against the actual temperature of the planet... I didn't just get off planet. the boat. I understand okay. that. I've read the lots same thing you have. You guys sound like the tobacco industry saying cigarettes oh. don't oh. cause cancer. Come on. Read your Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt is looked upon as a man who belongs on Mount Rushmore because he was a man who did something about conservation. I know it's not a popular idea, Nobody but we've got a population bomb in the world Bush isn't addressing. We've got deforestation Bush it's isn't addressing. We are not addressing any of the world's problems. Bush yeah. is the bad guy. By the way, nor is Rio addressing the global population. They are and Bush right. has addressed deforestation. Predictions, Fred. The person with the best chance to be Ross Perot's vice presidential running mate is Jean Kirkpatrick. Would add foreign policy heft, and she's a woman. Keen grasp of the obvious. Christopher. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan will be the Democratic candidate for vice president this summer. Jack. The Belmont. AP India is a cinch, unless it rains, in which case it's fine. Blood. <laughs> Morton. Jean Kirkpatrick will not take the uh, vice presidential nomination from Ross Perot. She will not? Not. She said she's interested. Too much character. Ah, uh, Bulletin. Pat Buchanan underwent elective and routine open-heart surgery on Friday to replace his aortic valve. On behalf of his fellow panelists, we wish Pat a swift and complete recovery. Next week, 
Jorge Bush goes to Rio. Bye-bye. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. Public affairs programming continues on Iowa Public Television as we present Iowa Press with host Dean Borg, coming up next. Iowa's executive and legislative branches of government still don't see eye to eye on some very basic budgetary matters. We get the perspective of Iowa's executive branch from Governor Terry Branstad on this edition of Iowa Press. But first, the June 2nd state primaries have come and gone with three overriding results. The turnout was low, there were significant victories and upsets, and some races were closer than expected. To give us some reading of the tea leaves for possible effects on the November election, here are Mike Glover of the Associated Press and Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa. Kay, the story of this week's primary wasn't the politicians on the ballot, but it was the people who showed up to vote for them. Almost no one. Asked to choose between Republicans and Democrats, voters found something else to do overwhelmingly. One more piece of evidence about just how meaningless these party labels have become. You know, Kay, I don't think voters are really angry. I think voters just don't think these politicians are terribly relevant. And that's the second story. Lacking that strong emotional tie, voters are going to be willing to dump sitting politicians at the drop of a hat. I think that hat is going to fall a lot this year. Mike, turnout was so low, there are probably precincts in Iowa in which more people voted on the Elvis stamp than actually <laughs> turned out and voted in their party primaries. Voters are angered by state government, they're concerned about the economy, but they're not tuning into politics to get things fixed. They're tuning out. And Kay, this is not some trendy, hot issue that's going to go away with some kind of a quick fix. This is a long-term trend of voters, citizens, tuning out their elected politicians. This may be the year the politicians reap the whirlwind of that trend. For Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa, I'm Mike Glover of the AP. That's our insight. Major funding for this program has been provided by Friends of Iowa Public Television. This is the Sunday, June 7th edition of Iowa Press. A conversation with Terry E. Branstad. Governor of Iowa. Here is Dean Borg. The 1992 legislature goes back into a second callback session this month, but before the legislature returns to the State House, legislative leaders and the governor are trying to reach some very basic agreements. Here to provide insight into those discussions is Terry Branstad, Governor of Iowa. Governor, welcome to Iowa Press. Thank you very much, Dean. Also joining us, two of our Iowa Press regulars from the State House beat, Mike Glover of the Associated Press and Eric Wilson of the Waterloo Courier. Governor, you've called the legislature back for a second special session. What is it that you want from this legislature? Well, I want to uh, reform the budgeting process. As an example, this year, revenues are estimated for the coming fiscal year to increase by 3.7 percent, but the legislature increased spending by 8.8 percent. .8%. That means we'd have to raise taxes every year into the foreseeable future. Iowans don't want that. We need to take spending off automatic pilot. A good share of that job has been done in the area of education, in a number of other areas, we've passed spending reforms. But in the area of Medicaid and state employee salaries, the work's not done, and I vetoed those measures and asked the legislature to work with me to come back and put some controls on those uh, increases. Okay, that's, that's what we're getting at. Specifically, what bills do you want that legislature to pass? Well, for instance, I don't think we can afford a $101 million increase in salaries for state employees. How much can we I afford? I think that uh, uh, it's going to have to be considerably less than that. I think if we're going to give those kind of increases, we've got to expect people to do more. I also think it's unfair to discriminate against the half of state employees that are not in union bargaining units. To give the people that are in unions 3% more than the rest of people, I think violates our comparable worth law that says equal pay for jobs of comparable worth, and I think it would be a mistake to do that. But uh, there are people that are talking uh, uh, about parity, meaning more layoffs. Because if you, if you pay all workers the same and you don't have enough money, you're going to be laying off more state workers than, than you uh, well, would otherwise. Well, there may have to be some additional layoffs, but I think also uh, we have reached a compromise on early retirement. So there's going to be an opportunity for some people to retire early. Uh, we have a hiring freeze. As people quit or retire, we don't replace them. 
And I think we need to look at how we can be more efficient in the way we operate government. How many layoffs are you, are, when you say maybe more, how many are you looking at? Well, it depends upon what we work out with the legislature, but I would like to try to minimize that, try to do as much as we can through early retirement and attrition. Mm -hmm. But frankly, the fact is we just can't afford a $101 million dollar increase in salaries well, with the budget. ballpark number of, didn't of you layoffs. From, didn't you ask for a hundred and five million dollar salary increase for state workers? The uh, what I asked for is that we have language that provides for equity. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't ask for it to be fully funded. In fact, I feel that we probably can't afford to fully fund it. But I'm willing to work with the legislature provided that we can get an equitable salary agreement. Most importantly, we need to control those areas like Medicaid that are going up twenty percent a year. All the money we saved from the layoffs last summer went just to pay for the cost overruns in Medicaid and foster care. Let's get let's, back to let's, Eric's let's, question. Let's, let's put some numbers on this. Earlier on, you were talking about 3,500 state workers might have to be laid off at the beginning of the budget year. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying something less than that. Give us a ballpark. Half that? 1,500? Well, it depends on where we end up. It could be that that would be the outside figure. That would be the largest amount. But I think that it could be considerably less than that, depending upon how it's managed. My goal would be to try to manage with the resources we have and to do it in the most efficient way possible. You know, it's an interesting thing, um, the idea that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And government will naturally spend every bit of money you give it. Mm -hmm. But the problem we need to do is make government live within the resources we have. When you say and I hear Iowans tell me that it's about time that we start having real budget controls and limitations. And what I'm doing is listening to the people of Iowa. I've been all over the state, and people have told me, we want spending reforms. We don't want spending to continue on automatic pilot. We're tired of these cost overruns and, and huge supplemental appropriations every year that drives the state into a deficit. Elaborate on that, not to fully fund this, the pay raises. Would you allow departments then to fund the remainder? Right. In fact, if we don't reach an agreement right now, the court has said that we have a contractual obligation to provide the salary increases. And I left the language in for the non-contract employees to also get an increase. So if we don't reach an agreement with the legislature, we can go ahead and provide those salary increases and will provide those salary increases for the new fiscal year, but they will be funded out of the budgets of the agencies and the institutions, which means they'll have to find ways to reduce spending in other ways in order to accommodate. But them. the head of the state worker union says if you take that step, if you start firing, furloughing, laying off workers, he's going to go right back to court and get more court orders ordering you to finance the races. Now, I've heard those threats before, but let me say, we very carefully reviewed what the court said. The court says the governor does have authority to veto appropriations. So you don't take that threat seriously? Well, I, I feel that what we're doing is appropriate and legally within our rights. We've also consulted with the Attorney General's office, and the Attorney General's office has told us that you can pay for the salary money without a specific appropriation for it. In fact, we're already doing that in this fiscal year because the courts have said we have a contractual obligation to do so, so we're going to pay for it. But the court did not say that we had to fund the number of employees that we presently have in state government. So if we have to, through early retirement, through attrition, through some staff reductions, reduce employment to pay for a $101 million increase in salary benefits, 9% plus a step increases, mm -hmm. some people could get up to 19%, uh, that's really beyond what the state of Iowa can afford at this point. How long is this battle with the state unions and the state workers going to go on? Well, it's my desire to resolve it in a way that, uh, that uh, will permanently control that growth in state spending as well as other areas. When do you get that done? Well, when hopefully this month. That's why I've said that uh, I want to see us uh, work together with the legislature to resolve it this month because yeah. this month is the last month of the fiscal year. I'd like to see it resolved now. I don't think we can continue to push it off till next year. And that's why I've taken the extraordinary action of making the tough decisions and making the spending cuts necessary. We have balanced the budget. Now we need to try to resolve these issues. Governor, you're the CEO of state government. One of the jobs the CEO has is making his company, his government work. Worker morale in this state is at an all-time low. A CEO who drove worker morale into that type of chaos would likely be fired. What responsibility do you have to get this state government workforce well, you see, there's together. a little difference between being a CEO of a company and being governor because in this case the board of directors is not uh, on my side the board of directors is the legislature and they're going in a different direction mm -hmm. and that's where why we're bringing the legislature back to try to work these things out now we've narrowed the issues considerably we've passed considerable spending reforms I've approved most of the budget 
I've zeroed in on those areas that are most out of mm -hmm. control in spending and said, if we have 3.7% growth in revenue, we can't let Medicaid go up 20-some percent. We can't spend another $101 million for salary increases beyond what we're spending for salaries already. So we need to pare that back. We need to reduce the size of those increases to something the state can afford. Uh, the natural spinoff of Mike's question, though, is you're in a tug-of-war with Don McKee, and, of course, the popular stand is more money for my people. Don McKee is... Uh, on that side. You're on the other side. How are you going to communicate your view to your employees? Well, somebody's got to represent the whole people of the state of Iowa. My obligation is not just to those people who work for state government. Uh, those people are pretty well taken care of. Uh, their wages have gone up a lot more than other people in the state of Iowa. We have a retirement system that's very good. We have a very fine system. And, we, and you know, we're not having a lot of people quit and leave government. So if people are unhappy, they're certainly not showing it by leaving. Uh, generally these jobs are pretty good and people stay in those jobs and I understand that and, and uh, I think that uh, we want to treat our employees well but we also have an obligation to the citizens and taxpayers to see that we're also protecting them against paying higher taxes year after year and a lot of people are saying you know more taxes are going to drive people and jobs and investments out of the state we're already losing many uh, people when they retire they look at the tax burden in Iowa and they say hey I can move somewhere else where the tax burden is not as great we not only lose the income that they provide to the state, we lose their charitable contributions and their investments to create jobs. Governor, we, you, you mentioned Medicaid a couple of times now. What do you expect the legislature to do in another special session that it hasn't done in a regular session or the first special Something. session? And what are you, <laughs> well, what are you going to do to get them to do it? Well, just as an example, uh, this uh, Medicaid is a tough issue, but it's one that needs to be addressed. I've recommended for years uh, reforming the tort liability system. We have a lot of defensive medicine that's being practiced that's costing us taxpayers millions of dollars. Tort reform is something that could be done, something I've recommended for five years. Uh, something that most states are doing, I think uh, it would be a, a modest uh, co-payment. Now, you pay that on your insurance. Just about everybody I know in the state of Iowa, except people on Medicaid, if they go to the doctor or hospital, but pay a small. And we're talking about Medicaid, $1, maybe a couple. Yeah, but $1, it, you see, if something's free, it's very easy to abuse it because it costs nothing. On the other hand, if you even have to pay one dollar or two dollars, then you can think twice about overutilizing that service. And this is our problem. It's being overutilized. The costs are beyond what we can afford. Doctors are doing things that they shouldn't have to do because they're afraid of being sued. And so we need to reform that system and we need to control it. Governor, and I've given the legislature four different options and frankly, uh, let me put the tort reform on the table. Let me suggest there are other things that can be done uh, in terms of uh, controlling some of the expensive equipment that's being leased uh -huh. in the area of Medicaid. We just can't ignore it. And that's what this legislature has done. It's totally ignored the problem, refused to even address it. Now, I've taken a lot of flack for having the courage to say we can't continue to go on with this on automatic pilot. But it's increasing over 20% a year and the state doesn't have the kind of resource. It will totally eat up our budget within the next four or five years. All the growth will go to Medicaid if we don't do something about Governor, it. Governor, you have vetoed all of the money, $276 million for no, Medicaid. No, I didn't. You didn't? I left $25 million in a separate appropriation. Okay, you well, vetoed most of the yes, $276 I million. Yes, I did. I vetoed $276 million of Medicaid. Right. I left $25 million in a separate appropriation. Uh -huh. So there is a source of funding for Medicaid. And incidentally, we're spending like $9 million a week on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So we have enough money to get by for a few weeks. And if we had to, we could transfer money from other, from other accounts to cover that until it's resolved. But I want to see this thing resolved before the 1st of July, before the new fiscal year begins. There are 18,000 elderly Iowans staying in nursing homes and being paid by Medicaid. Can you assure them that they're not going to be tossed out in the streets? Absolutely. How? We're not going to let that be done because, first of all, I expect the legislature to work with us and resolve it before the 1st of July. If they don't, we do have that $25 million appropriation there and we'll transfer money to that account week by week as we need to but I want to see this thing resolved I want to see us reform the the what is Medicaid it, spending process what does it take to get a sales tax increase back on the table or is that just gone what I said is first of all I think the focus needs to be on controlling spending and when you have 3.7 percent growth in revenue we need to get spending in line with that as opposed to the 8.8 percent passed by the legislature I won't consider a sales tax increase unless we get the spending reforms that I've indicated earlier. Do you want that to be part of the mix? I feel that spending reform is essential. And no sales tax. You Medicaid, well, 
if, if it were to go to pay off the gap deficit and to get the state's fiscal house in order and we controlled the property taxes and got the spending reforms, I've said I would accept it. I don't want to raise taxes, but I would accept that if it were something that was going to solve the problem. But if it's just a way to get by for one year so we can spend more money and then have to raise taxes again next year, I don't want to have any part of it. Property tax freeze then is still something uh, on the table? Yes, and of course we've agreed to a, a compromise that would just cap property taxes and say they could not go up more than the rate of inflation, and local governments could add all new construction, all new uh, construction to that base. So, and e even with that, we also have a, uh, a provision where if it were an extraordinary problem, they could go to the appeals board. So I believe that Iowans want to control property tax. It's the most unfair and unpopular tax we have. It's higher than the national average. And I believe very strongly that with over half the state budget going back to local governments, and that is what is one of the things that's really straining our state budget, is the cost we're paying for the court system and all of that, that it is appropriate for us to control property But tax. there are also a lot of people saying, what does uh, passing a property tax freeze do to clean up the budget mess that you and the legislature have well, created? Well, over half the state budget is going back to local governments to replace property taxes. And when over half of our budget is going there, I think we have to control property taxes. And if we're going to be raising the sales tax in order to provide that money, then we need to assure people their property taxes aren't going to go up. Governor, too. if we're talking about things being on the bargaining table, are you bargaining with legislative leaders? Have you met with them? Have you talked with them? How's that going? I've had several conversations with legislative leaders. I intend to uh, discuss, uh, further discuss this in the next several days with legislative leaders. Uh, and, and what are you discussing? The timing of a session? Are you discussing these issues? We're what discussing the issues. We're discussing the need to control spending, those things that didn't get done in the first special session or the regular session that need to be accomplished in order to assure the citizens of Iowa that they're not going to be faced with a budget deficit again You're next year. making progress? I, yes, I think we're making some progress, but frankly there's a lot of heavy lifting involved here uh, and the House Democrats have been a, a major problem and uh, Bob Arnold has told me that, you know, he'd like to see as much resolve before they come back and mm -hmm. like to keep the session down to one or two days at most because uh, of the problems of getting things resolved. What's in the biggest cars. problem you've got? What's the toughest thing to get? I'm not sure that I can identify a specific thing. I think the problem is for the legislature to recognize that they need to be part of the solution. They can't just walk away from it as they did last year, as they did at, during the special session. They need to be part of reforming the budgeting process. They did some important work during the session. They added some additional things during the special session. But when it came to the heavy lifting, when it came to things like reforming the Medicaid system, making the salary bill equitable and something we could live with, and also controlling property taxes, they weren't willing when to do When is that it. session likely to convene? It depends upon uh, the progress we make with legislative leaders, but sometime during the month of June. I mean, isn't it better to get it early in the month? I mean, if they come in in late June, they're going to be looking I want to solve it. the problem. I don't want to have to have another special session. I, I've already, I tried to bring them back early, mm -hmm. uh, before the primary, before we made a decision on the sales tax, uh, and we gave them an opportunity to do it early. Uh, they failed to complete the work on that. So now I think it's important to wait. If we have to wait late, we have to. I prefer to do it as soon as we can, as soon as we can get agreement. But I also recognize it's not just getting the leadership to agree on it, because we had the leadership trying to sell the, the reforms last time, but it fell apart. Uh, we have to get uh, both houses of the legislature, a majority in both houses, to vote for these things. And that's not an easy thing to do. Let's, let's try to They're take tough decisions. They're things that people would like to walk away from. They're, they're things that people would like to wish away, but they aren't going to happen that way. Sure. And that's why I've taken the leadership to say, I'm going to balance the budget through the veto process, but now let's come back together and fix it. Let's try to take a longer range uh, view here. We've been talking about the special That's session. Exactly you, what I'm looking you've at. Always, the long term. <laughs> you've always talked about education and, and economic development being your two priorities. But what's your vision for the next two years? I mean, there are a lot of people that see layoffs, more cuts, more lawsuits, and, and more bickering as, as you know the only thing we're going to get for the next two years. What's the vision, and how do you get us there? Well, the vision is to go in and control those areas that are going to e literally eat up all the growth and revenue. And I showed these charts to people at town meetings all across the state, and there's two things, state employee salary increases and Medicaid. If we don't control those, there won't be any money left for education and economic development. And that's the reason why I played, that's the reason why people say, well, Governor, why, why are you playing hardball? Why are you being so tough on this? 
because I don't see any choice but addressing these difficult issues. If we don't, then we're not going to be able to have the kind of world-class education system. We're not going to be able to make the investments we want to make in economic development. And I believe it's essential that we do that. And the only way that I think we can afford to do that in the long term is to control the growth in these areas of the budget that are beyond. But, but, and we're not but, talking about cutting this below last year. In the end, if we could just control the growth, instead of having Medicaid going up 20%, get it down more in line with what's realistic. But we talk about vision, and, and we get right back into the, the fighting with the legislature and the sales but, tax. And I the can give you the vision. Let's, I can give you the vision. Please do. The vision is that we control spending. We take all spending off automatic pilot. And then, each year, we decide on focusing our resources on those things that are going to make a difference. And those would be like education and economic development. What we have right now is we've taken education off automatic pilot, we've cut economic development funding, but we've got Medicaid going up over 20% a year and, and, they, and it's snowballing. We've got state employee salaries without any controls on it uh, going up $110, $101 million this year beyond what we can afford. Now, people don't want more government and more costs. They want us to focus the resources where it's going to make a difference. They also want to cut out some of the, of the things that... that uh, some of the, the waste and abuse that's going on. And there's plenty of it, I think, that can be addressed in that Medicaid area. It's well, not easy, but one, if we just controlled the defensive medicine that doctors are doing so they won't get sued by reforming the tort system, mm -hmm. if we just put in place, for instance, a modest uh, uh, copay so that people wouldn't be going to the doctor or hospital when they don't need it, I think we would save a considerable amount of money, and it is working in a number of other states. Governor, are we in danger then, state, though, of eating our seed corn? You mentioned earlier thousands of people during the 1980s left the state. They were potential taxpayers. Uh, you're downsizing government now to meet a smaller Iowa, to serve a smaller Iowa. But in eating our seed corn, in economic development and other things, are we, we ever going to get back to where we want to be? Well, we don't want to eat our seed corn. In fact, yesterday I was down in St. Louis talking to the Monsanto people, and they want to have a seed corn now... That, that is genetically engineered to stop uh, corn borers. So we don't even have to use chemicals, but, but just as an example, I, I think what we want to do is we want to adjust our priorities so that we are able to invest in economic development. And frankly, I have approved the economic development budget. We are going to continue to aggressively move forward in economic development. We may not have quite the level of funding we had two years ago, but I think we have good programs and we're making progress. And you know, we're beginning to see the population of Iowa increase again, school populations going up. We've had some success in diversifying and bringing biotechnology companies here, and we want to continue in that course. It, it seems that one source of revenue, though, is built on quicksand, and that was the gambling industry. That's, That's right. kind of slipping away from you. Well, first of all, I've never been a proponent of gambling. I think the state's responsibility is to regulate it and control it. We ought to focus on tourism and recreation, and I... Uh, I never expected we'd get a lot of money from gambling, and I'm not at all surprised that uh, the uh, allure uh, of gambling is starting to wear off as people find out there's a, lot more there's a lot more losers than winners. There are some people that are going to want to gamble. I just want to make sure that it's, that it's fair and that the state ag adequately controls and protects it to protect the integrity of the state. Governor, you like to talk about going to these town meetings and hearing the voice of the people and the people are demanding that these tough steps be taken and people want things reined in. If that's the case, why, according to this Heartland poll at the University of Iowa, are you the most unpopular governor in the Midwest? Well, when you make tough decisions, it's not always popular. But I think in the long term, people respect and appreciate leadership and somebody that has the courage to make the tough decisions. And I think in the long term, it's going to be good politics as well as good government. How is it going to be good politics to drive your approval rating into the 20s? Well, because I believe that once people see the results of reforming the spending processes, getting spending off automatic pilot, and seeing that taxes aren't...